Welcome to today's webinar, Build Beyond Zero, New Ideas for Carbon Smart Architecture, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in association with the Smart Growth Network. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth Network, supported by the US EPA's Office of Community Revitalization and managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website at smartgrowth.org that provides information on effective growth development and preservation practices. The Clearinghouse provides information to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is also the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of smart growth. This webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Maryland Department of Planning on smart growth and planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. You can also find out about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educa educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. We are recording this webinar and will be posting it on our website under the Webinar Archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter to learn about our upcoming webinars. The views expressed by the speakers in this webinar are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning or the State of Maryland. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association, as well as one Sustainability and Resilience CM credit and 1.5 CNU ACEU self-reported credits from the Congress for the New Urbanism. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event, which is Build Beyond Zero, New Ideas for Carbon Smart, Smart Architecture. You can also search for event number 9250331. I would like to acknowledge our webinar partner today, Island Press, and their partnerships manager, Jen Hawes. Founded in 1984, Island Press's mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and protect the environment and to create solutions to its complex problems. So today our speakers are Bruce King and Chris Magwood. Bruce King has been a structural engineer for more than 40 years, designing buildings of every size and type all over the world. He is the author of The New Carbon Architecture and Build Beyond Zero with Chris Magwood, and also wrote the ASTM Standard for Earthen Construction, the Marin County Low Carbon Concrete Code, and the books Buildings of Earth and Straw, Making Better Concrete, and Design of Straw Bale Buildings. Bruce is the founder and director of the Ecological Building Network, or EBN Net, a nonprofit information resource that sponsors the Build Well Source at buildwellsource.org, an online library of low carbon and carbon storing materials. Also, Chris Magwood has been designing and building carbon positive buildings for 25 years. In 2012, he helped to found the Endeavor Center, the Sustainable Building School in Peterborough, Ontario, where he led the Builders for Climate Action Project, designing tools and policies to support carbon smart architecture. He is the author of seven books about sustainable building materials and techniques, and is the editor of the, of the Sustainable Building Essentials series. Following their presentation, our presenters will answer as many questions as time permits. As always, you can submit a question anytime by using the questions tool located in the control panel on the right side of your screen. And as usual, for those who've joined us before, we're going to take a quick poll to get started, just asking where you all are from today. And if you're unable to respond to this, you may need to exit from full screen mode to select one of the choices on your screen um, geographically. And we'll give you a, a few seconds to fill this in and then we'll share the results and then get started with our presentation today. And thanks to everybody who's here with us. We'll just give you a couple more seconds to respond and thanks to everybody who is so today uh 34 percent of the audience reports being in the mid-atlantic or northeast of the u.s 22 percent in the west 20 
12% in the Midwest, including Canada, 18% in the South, including Mexico, and 8% of our audience is international today. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Magwood to get us started. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, and uh, I will just um, ensure that my screen is visible. We're still waiting to see it. Okay. Uh, sorry, this worked uh, quickly last time and uh, is not doing so this time. I think John just resent you the prompt. Okay. Okay, is it showing now? It is not. All right, my apologies, everybody. Uh, we did a, a run through of this the other day and it all went smoothly. Um, there we go. Yes, it's now visible. Yes, you're good to go. Okay, wonderful. Uh, okay, sorry for that uh, slow start. Um, really glad uh, on behalf of both myself and Bruce uh, that you're able to join us. Uh, we're excited. The, uh, the book, Build Beyond Zero, uh, is uh, released quite recently, and this is the first time that the two of us have presented uh, about it together. So it's really uh, exciting to be able to uh, present to you in this audience. and. Um, if you are interested in the book, um, you can order it from Island Press. The website is there. And if you use the discount code SMART, you will save 30% uh, on that. Okay. This presentation is gonna bounce uh, between Bruce and I, so I'm gonna kick things off. Um, my my um, stated goal in the work that I'm doing in the building space is to really help change buildings from being the uh, climate villains that they are currently into climate heroes. Uh, Bruce and I both think that buildings have this unique potential to um, not only sort of be part of reducing emissions, but to actually reversing them. And what we'd like to show you today is how we think buildings, the, the materials that make our buildings can go from contributing about 6 billion tons per year of emissions to storing 15 billion tons uh, of carbon per year. And it's, a, it's an ambitious uh, goal, but one that we think is both uh, realistic and uh, absolutely necessary. So if anybody has thought much about buildings and emissions in the past, uh, it has been around the operational side of, uh, of buildings. So um, as we heat buildings, cool buildings, run lights in buildings, uh, the energy that it takes to do all of that creates emissions. And over the past 25 years, a whole lot of people have spent uh, a lot of really important time and effort really working on how do we reduce that pool of emissions from buildings. But what's been missed and is only just recently starting to, uh, to be acknowledged is that the actual making of the buildings causes an awful lot of emissions too. So the materials that go into buildings, the transportation of those materials, the construction processes themselves, uh, all of that is responsible for uh, a whole bunch of emissions. And it's really only been over the past decade or so that um, there's been a real effort put into figuring out how big is that pool of emissions? Where do they come from and what can we do about it? And what we know from looking at both of these pools of emissions is that the, the upfront what we call embodied carbon. So all of those emissions that happen from harvesting raw materials, transporting them to a factory, turning them into a building product and getting them into a building, all of that creates a pretty big burst of emissions at the start of the building's life. So in this diagram, that's that sort of uh, dark uh, yellow orange line at the beginning. So it's not unusual for uh, a building, a typical North American building to have at least 400 kilograms of emissions per square foot uh, uh, or per square meter of building area. And so, you know, when, when a building is built, 
there's sort of this large uh, pool of emissions that have gone into the atmosphere to get it there. And then the blue line sort of characterizes the emissions that happen as we operate the building. So it, it rises because, you know, year after year, you sort of accumulate emissions um, as the building is uh, powered and, and heated and cooled. And so early on, when people started to think about buildings and climate, we would look at, you know, in this case, maybe the 30 year total or the 60 year total, and we'd go, well, the operating emissions are a pretty big part of that. So, you know, that's where the attention went. Um, and part of the reason the operating emissions look big is because for a long time we've been making uh, fairly inefficient uh, buildings that use both a lot of energy and therefore generate a lot of emissions. All the work that's happened recently with um, uh, updating building codes, making buildings more energy efficient, retrofitting buildings, adding insulation, improving the air tightness of buildings, all of that has started to bend that operating carbon emissions side of the equation down. But you'll notice what hasn't changed is that burst of emissions at the start, uh, because we still tend to make buildings the same way today uh, as we did you know, 15, 20, 25 years ago. So as we reduce those operating emissions, um, that upfront embodied carbon represents you know, more and more uh, of the total carbon footprint of the building. And now as we push buildings towards uh, zero carbon operationally, and you know, there are a number of uh, programs and codes and sort of incentives to get buildings there, there are quite a few buildings that uh, are already there. The operational uh, emission side of the, of the equation is going to get very thin, and yet that upfront embodied carbon piece is still really large and, and relatively unchanged uh, over the last few decades. Now, if we zoom in to any of those uh, three graphs, whether it's the average performance scenario you're seeing here, or the enhanced performance, or even the zero carbon performance, if we zoom in to say between now and 2030, what you'll notice is that it's these uh, material related emissions, the embodied carbon emissions that are now, you know, the, the, the majority of the emissions that we need to deal with. So, if we need to reduce emissions from the building sector by, you know, you can fill in your, your number, 40% uh, by 2030, 50% by 2030, that really it is these material related emissions that, that need to drop because in such a narrow time window, the operational emissions, even from uh, an average performing building, just haven't had enough time to, uh, to accumulate to any, any large degree yet. So that, that time factor is what makes the issue that we're talking about today so critical. So driving both of these types of emissions, whether it's the operational or the embodied emissions uh, down to zero is great. That's, you know, that's been, uh, as Bruce and I say in the book, the, the rallying cry of, of the green building movement is getting to zero. But what we wanna set up in the book and what we'll talk about today is that really zero is not much of a target. We wanna see buildings uh, go beyond zero so that instead of just doing less harm, which is you know, bringing uh, emissions down, we're actually getting into the realm where buildings are healing the climate, where there's now less CO2 in the atmosphere because we made a building than there was before we made that building. And the way that we get there requires um, a whole sort of range of uh, transparency requirements um, so that we know how to calculate those emissions, we know how to reduce those emissions, and we know which materials are actually storing carbon. And uh, if you're a, uh, you know, a building LCA nerd, this is very high level stuff, but if you're new to this, um, the way that we look at emissions from building materials is through documents called environmental product declarations, which are sort of like the nutrition label for uh, building materials where uh, we can find out for a certain amount of material what the global warming potential of that material is. So in the same way, you might rely on the nutrition label to tell you, you know, how many, uh, uh, what your total fat might be or your cholesterol. In this case, you know, we're looking at the global warming potential of a particular material. And then what, uh, what we do in building life cycle assessment is add up the 
global warming potential from all of those EPDs for every product and material that goes into a building so that we can get a total uh, kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per meter squared of building area. And so that then allows us to compare one building to another, to set targets, to set thresholds. And in the case of what we're talking today, you know, getting that kilograms of CO2e per meter squared down from positive territory and into um, carbon storing or what we would see as negative numbers in this um, in this realm. So, you know, building, whether you're a building owner or a designer or a constructor or a regulator, this is the kind of accounting that goes on in the background that allows us to set targets and caps and thresholds and to do so kind of in line with wider climate action plans. So if you know what a, an existing building that you're building or that's in your jurisdiction, you know, is emitting, so say it is 400 kilograms of CO2e per meter squared, and you know that you have a target of reducing that by 30% by 2030, then you need to start designing buildings that are 30% less than that 400 kilograms of CO2e per meter squared. There's two, two strategies for getting buildings below zero. There are a bunch of materials, and Bruce is going to talk about these in just a moment, where currently they are responsible for uh, a high amount of emissions, but there are things that we can do both today and uh, coming up in the near future that will lower the impacts from those high emission materials. And then we can increase the use of materials that have negative emissions or that have net carbon storage. And uh, I will be talking about those after Bruce talks about uh, concrete steel and, and other high emitting materials. So with that, I will turn it over to Bruce, who will uh, talk to you about those high emitting materials and what we can do about them. Thank you, Chris. And I have to add before I go plunging into the wonderful world of concrete here that um, something Chris mentioned for all of you to be as clear, at least as uh, minimally confused as the rest of us are in, in, in all these conversations that um, Chris and I are part of around buildings and carbon. About half the people will talk about carbon storing materials and buildings as being carbon negative and the other half will talk about them as being carbon positive. In other words, there's a lot of unfortunate semantic confusion as to when you get beyond zero, are you in negative territory or positive territory? You can make an argument either way. Uh, Chris and I generally go along with our colleagues and just call it carbon smart or climate smart building. Well, mineral architecture is roughly half of the picture here, um, maybe even more, but basically that's concrete and metals. There's also glass, there's a number of things, but concrete is certainly the big one. Uh, we make a lot of concrete in this world. I'm about to show you if it were an emitting country, it would be the third largest emitter in the world. Um, what's the big deal about concrete? Well, if you wondered how big is a ton of concrete, how big would the cube be? If you guessed desk height, you'd be right. It's 29 inches on a side makes a ton of concrete. 10 billion tons is what we human beings produce every year and place on the earth somewhere. I got to thinking about that. It's a big number. So, hmm, 10 million tons seems like kind of a lot. If you tried to guess how big that was, I'll let you think for a moment, and then say, if you guessed a mile on a side, you'd be right. It would make a cube a mile on a side, roughly five times the height of the Eiffel Tower. Concrete pound for pound is a very low carbon material. It's a fantastic building material, part of why we use so much of it. But it accounts for 8% of global warming emissions. Well, how does that happen? Well, concrete is artificial rock. You take a bunch of little rocks, you glue them together to get a big rock, and that's concrete. That's the whole industry summed up. Typically, you got about 80% sand and gravel, little rocks, glued together with some sort of binder, and the binder we typically use is Portland cement. Baked limestone, it was a technological step forward from the lime plasters that had been around for millennia. And uh, some fella in England figured out that if you cooked it a little more and added a little clay and gypsum, he'd get something really bomb proof that's a fantastic building material. He invented it 200 years ago, it took over the world because it's so idiot proof, simple and cheap. And it accounts for a lot of emissions. 
But it's worth pausing here before I say more about that to just note that we have had concrete as human beings since the first day we started building. With 10,000 years or more, we've been making buildings with clay concrete, also known as earthen architecture. Clay concrete isn't as strong as Portland cement concrete. It, it's doesn't, not as durable in the rain, but you can do a lot of stuff with it. Lower right picture is the city of Shabam in Yemen, which is a thousand years old, continuously occupied in a seismic country. And yet it's doing just fine. Taos Pueblo in New Mexico. In the lower left, the Cobb buildings of southwestern England that have been around for hundreds of years. You can make durable, wonderful buildings out of clay. And it just got a big leap forward when Francis Carre was awarded the highest award in architecture, the Pritzker Prize, just a couple of months ago for his, among other things, for his delightful designs using natural materials, sticks, straw, and earth. Earthen buildings coming forward into the modern times with technological improvements, little tricks we can do to keep the simplicity of clay construction and do ever better things with it. This is from the Stanford University campus. They're basically rammed earth concrete blocks, with much lower carbon footprint, much nicer to look at, and they work really well. That said, mostly what we use is Portland cement. So if we want to lower the footprint of concrete, we've got to find better ways to glue things together because the Portland cement is the crux of the problem. You have to bake limestone at 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a lot of energy. That's a lot of emissions, not just for the fuel you use, but for the chemical transformation of limestone into calcium oxide. You can change that. You can use supplementary materials to replace a lot of that cement. There's a whole world of efforts going on right now to reinvent cement and to make aggregate out of waste materials in various ways, which would save us having to rip up riverbeds and stream beds everywhere, but also holds the opportunity of turning emissions themselves into gravel and rock to make concrete. A brief picture of where we are right now. The near-term future uh, of concrete is we're going to be replacing Portland cement with these supplemental materials, which are widely, cheaply available. Limestone and clay, they're all over the world and you can just grind them up uh, and sometimes burn them a little bit, mix them in with the cement and lower your carbon footprint by 30, 40, 50%. Available technology approved by building departments now. Then there's metals, mainly steel. Steel accounts for about 6% of global emissions and about half of steel goes into buildings in one way or another. Uh, there's a lot of other metals, of course, copper, aluminum, and so on that have especially aluminum, very high carbon footprints, but we just don't use that much. So it's kind of hard to focus on them, but steel's a big deal. And steel already recycles at a very high rate. This is a recycling plant in the picture. So great, they're recycling a lot, but you still need very intense energy to melt it back down again and reuse it. All metals and glass are in this category of needing very intense energy. You can't replace metals with something else. With concrete, you can replace Portland cement with all sorts of things. Metal you got to have metal. You want to deliver electrical power, you need copper. You want to do a lot of things in buildings, you need steel. So we need to have intense energy, and that takes us straight to hydrogen. That's the future of the steel industry, is a transformation from depending on fossil fuels to hydrogen. And for those of you who don't already know, hydrogen is not an energy source. It's just a storage medium. You deliver a lot of hydrogen that was made on a wind farm in Texas or a solar array in Arizona, and you turn it into hydrogen that can be shipped to Chicago and Denver to keep people warm in the winter. Hydrogen is a storage medium. One other little category that it turns out to be a huge one, refrigerants. These are the chemicals, hydrochlorofluorocarbons and their related elements. Um, the two two basic things in buildings you can use them as the blowing agent to make foam insulation both rigid boards and spray foam insulation that is ubiquitous now at least in north america but also as the um, cooling agent in air conditioners and heat pumps by which you can um, extract heat from the air and deliver it to a building or extract heat from a building and push it outside Clever devices, but those um, chemicals are a little bit nasty. They have several hundred, sometimes several thousand times global warming potential of carbon dioxide. And so they have risen quickly to the top of everybody's attention as a uh, something we need to improve on fast. 
for the sake of the climate. Those air conditioners that are sitting in the back of a lot of houses or shopping centers, this is a shopping center in my neighborhood, there's one in yours, they leak. They drip, drip, drip over time. And that stuff is really potent and it really changes the climate. So there's a lot of work going on to find different kinds of refrigerants. And in a world that's building the equivalent of another New York City every 35 days, this really matters because guess what? They're building most of these buildings out of concrete. You don't see it here in North America. That might seem a little weird. Another 30, every 35 days, another New York? Yes, that's how fast it's going. And if you've been to any city of these cities, as I have in the last few years, you'll have seen it and it's jaw dropping. And you know what they do in Beijing when they finally move in? I mean, this is a big step up. You move from the countryside in China and you get to the big city and you move. This is residential housing in Beijing. This is typical. And they just get a concrete shell. If you want to stay warm in the winter, you got to put one of those air conditioners in your window and turn it on. It's about as inefficient a way to condition space as you could possibly have. All of those are drip, drip, dripping all the time. So a lot of opportunity there to improve. Another way to draw down carbon is to literally draw down carbon. And you see pictures of machines like this, big metal contraptions that are filtering carbon dioxide out of the air and turning it into liquid or gaseous carbon dioxide. And perhaps like me, you laugh, ha ha ha, don't these fools know about forests that do it all the time on, with solar energy and they do it for free. Or for that matter, the fields where we grow our rice and wheat and barley and our, the food that we eat, they're doing this all the time, turning atmospheric carbon into carbon, which is true, but they're not doing it in a way that we can reuse it. We're gonna need to have carbon capture in various forms so that we can then turn it into, among other things, building materials. We're doing, we're turning captured carbon into all sorts of things right now. It's a fast growing industry, but you can turn it into aggregate for concrete, plastics, and refrigerants, and all sorts of other things, such as plastics. Um, we all love to hate plastics, perhaps, and we also love to love plastics. You could probably identify uh, couple dozen plastic polymers. If you just looked around the room right now, you're probably wearing some on your body. They were instrumental in delivering you your last meal. They're part of our lives. We're probably not gonna get rid of them, but can we do better, improve on them? Well, that's still a pretty dire situation in that the industry is still planning to build a lot more plastics. With only a slight hiccup in the recession of 2008, plastics production has gone up another hockey stick curve in our lives. And we're gonna keep ramping that up even further. One of the results of fracking is that uh, the industry has a lot of compounds that they wanted to use for fuel, but nobody's driving so much anymore because of the pandemic. Say, so, oh, we'll build plastic plants. And if you've noticed a lot more plastic flowing through your household or your company or through your city lately, that's because there's a lot more plastic out there and they're selling it for every possible purpose. Difficult situation and something to be addressed. I throw this in here. This is a brick made out of bacteria, uh, biomason uh, in North Carolina, but it's emblematic of a fast growing industry where we're turning to the little ones, the microbes, algae, bacteria, and fungi that we can use to grow building materials, make plastics that can revert back to soil and be biodegradable. There's a huge opportunity there that I can only touch on here. But speaking of crops and straw, I'm gonna hand this back over to Chris by mentioning to you that the concrete cube is a mile on a side, like I told you. If you harvested all the straw in the world, it's just a simple byproduct of growing our food and compressed it into a density about like a straw bale, it would be nearly two miles on a side, 1.8 miles, something like that. That's how much straw is available in the world to do something with. And it turns out to be a great building material half of which is carbon. So I'm gonna hand it over to Chris with that. Thank you, Bruce. And I will pick it up from there um, because I'm going to now talk about bio-based architecture. Um, straw, as Bruce mentioned, is, is one of the things uh, that we will talk about but really all bio-based architecture starts with that sort of remarkable process of photosynthesis 
where these plants <clears throat> of all different sizes and shapes from you know giant uh, 120 foot high uh, spruce and pine trees to you know tiny little grasses like uh, like straw and rice all pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere they split that co2 molecule up the carbon stays in the plant becomes part of the body of the plant and the oxygen comes back out into the atmosphere for you and i to breathe and so all plant matter uh, that, that's growing on the planet uh, has a lot of carbon in it and all of that carbon came from the atmosphere and so depending on the plant somewhere between sort of 35 to 55 percent of the dry weight uh, of, of that plant matter is carbon that had been in the atmosphere uh, fairly recently if it's an annual crop that CO2 is in the atmosphere just months ago. If it's a large tree, some of that CO2 would have been pulled down, you know, 50, 60 years ago and right up until today. But these, these plants are a, a remarkable source of, um, of CO2 for, uh, or of carbon that has been drawn out of the atmosphere. And one of the things we can do is put this stuff into buildings. So there is a natural carbon cycle um, that's, been taking place on the planet for uh, forever. And as we have started intentionally growing a lot of materials for human use, that cycle has sort of continued. We have uh, plants and crops that draw down literally billions and billions of tons of CO2 uh, every year. But for the most part, um, we, we return that CO2 back to the atmosphere fairly quickly, um, whether it's uh, as waste, as garbage, um, it either goes into landfills and turns into methane, or it gets it gets burned, uh, it gets rotted in the field. But in some way, shape, or form, there's this loop happening where uh, we we plant plants and grow plants. They pull a lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere, and shortly thereafter, it goes back into the atmosphere. And that's been fine. That's a great way for a planet to operate uh, when the inhabitants of that planet are not. Um, throwing additional billions of tons of CO2 into the atmosphere and, and making the climate uh, very unstable. So one of the things that we can do with this biomass, if we build with it, if we put the biomass into buildings, is interrupt that cycle and interrupt it in a way that could be uh, really uh, a key part of how we will help fix the climate crisis. So, you know, we can, we know that all of that biomass is drawing all of that CO2 out of the atmosphere. But if instead of letting it go right back to the atmosphere shortly after we harvest it, if we can put it into buildings, buildings are great repositories for this material because they last a long time. We know all the materials that go into them. We know when a building reaches the end of its life. We know when it gets demolished. So we're kind of putting it in a in as safe a place as we can. and helping to reduce the CO2 burden in the atmosphere by uh, locking up a bunch of that carbon in building materials. So in the book, we talk about five different categories of biomass. So obviously there's lots of stuff that grows on the planet, but how we think about the, the sort of math of um, calculating the value of that carbon storage um, and, and understanding what stocks that we have available for building, it can help to sort of categorize them into wood. And in particular, we're now thinking a lot about wood as mass timber, which is being used more and more to make uh, taller and taller buildings. We can think of agricultural residues. So the, the straw that Bruce mentioned, that's uh, a cube two miles on a side every year, um, but also all kinds of agricultural residues from uh, nutshells to stalks to um, uh, seeds, all sorts of parts of the plants that we already grow but we don't eat. And then there are purpose grown crops that we specifically plant and harvest to make building materials. There are waste stream fibers. So uh, a plant was grown for a purpose other than making a building, but when that product reaches the end of its life, there's a way to take that, uh, that carbon and put it in a building. And finally, the really uh, exciting and, and, as Bruce mentioned, quickly developing realm of lab-grown materials. So we'll start by quickly talking about timber. 
which if you have heard about or thought about carbon storing building materials at all, there's a good chance it was uh, talked about in the form of timber. And interestingly enough, for uh, a couple of people, Bruce and I, who are keen on carbon storing architecture, um, we're not particularly uh, keen or not keen yet uh, on timber as uh, the carbon storing answer to all our building concerns. And that's simply because the kind of math that we do to figure out um, the carbon impact of, uh, of using different materials, it just isn't complete for timber. There's a lot that isn't counted. And so while we can definitely say, you know, that two by four in my house has, you know, a certain uh, weight of carbon atoms in it, what we can't say is that there's less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because I put that two by four in my building. And that's because about half of the volume of the tree that we cut down never makes it into that two by four. Um, there's another 20% of the mass of that tree in its root system that is going to uh, rot in place and go back into the atmosphere. And we also know that there's a lot of carbon release from the soils when we, uh, when we harvest forests, both from um, exposing that ground during harvesting, but also from erosion when that ground is, uh, is exposed to rain. And also that the, the trees we plant, we replant to replace those trees, they start very small. And so if you cut down a tree in the prime of its carbon storing life uh, and replace it with a couple little seedlings, those seedlings aren't drawing carbon down at that same rate for, for a good couple of decades. So I wouldn't say we're speaking against timber architecture, but we're not certain that uh, timber as a carbon storage uh, option is, is a particularly good one. Although there's lots of great reasons, other great reasons uh, to be building uh, buildings with timber. What we are more excited about is uh, the realm of agricultural residues. So the great thing about ag residue is that we don't have to change anything that we're currently doing uh, on the planet right now to take advantage of this. So the farmers of the world are already planting these crops. They're already harvesting these crops. In most cases, they're actually harvesting the residues for the crops and then either burning those residues or letting those residues rot off. And so all of that stored carbon, <clears throat> which could be going into buildings, ends up going back to the atmosphere. And if you want a sense of the scale that this happens at, uh, we grow about 2.2 billion tons of uh, various grain straws each year. So we grow the plant, we want to eat the seeds off the top of the plant, and the stem is the straw. And so there's a couple billion tons of that straw grown every year. And so each year, the carbon that's stored in that straw has drawn down all of India's greenhouse gas emissions. So to the tune of about 4 billion tons of CO2 is pulled out of the atmosphere in the grain crops that we grow, but then we just let it go back to the atmosphere. So if we could keep half of that annual grain straw harvest and put it into buildings, we would be achieving about a 2 billion ton per year drawdown using a material that's uh, already being grown on the planet. So no land use change, no new industries or anything like that. So we're really excited about ag residues. Straw is just one example. There are so many examples. Um, if you tried to, I've tried to total um, all of the ag residue uh, volume in the world and it's, it's in the, it's in the uh, 20 to 40 billion tons per year. So there's a, a lot of the material around and it's, it exists everywhere that humans exist because we're growing food uh, everywhere that we live. We also have purpose-grown crops, both crops that have been uh, around for centuries as building material, such as the uh, cork oak uh, forests in the Mediterranean region and bamboo forests uh, all through Asia, where you know, people have intentionally uh, either planted and grown or at least maintained those stands so that those materials can be harvested specifically to put into buildings. And more recently, uh, at least in North America, the return of, of hemp as a crop, which has always had building purposes and people are finding both uh, old and new ways to put hemp to work in buildings. 
And also seaweed has uh, been developing uh, as the now a purpose-grown crop and one of the great uses of seaweed is also uh, as a building material. Waste stream fibers abound all over the planet. Uh, if there's one thing we've been good at as human beings, it's uh, generating a lot of waste. And so a lot of, uh, a lot of that sort of carbon-based waste can find its way back into storage in buildings. Um, often the products are sort of uh, unspectacular and, and kind of, uh, I'm thinking of cellulose insulation here, which is made from waste newsprint and cardboard. It's kind of one of the, the unglamorous heroes of carbon storage in that um, there's a, a, an industry already formed around uh, both making and installing cellulose insulation and it's one of those uh, products that can turn the overall carbon footprint of a fairly typical building uh, and tip it towards being a carbon storing building already today and then there are lots of uh, available streams of uh, textiles in the form of waste clothing that can be remade into uh, building materials Couple of really interesting companies taking uh, drinking boxes and drinking cartons and turning that into building materials. And even a company that takes urban biomass by which they really just is a glamorous word for grass clippings from uh, highway medians and around airports and turning that into an insulation material. So no shortage of different waste stream fibers that can end up in buildings. And then excitingly uh, lab grown materials, uh, whereas Bruce hinted, um, you know, mycelium is uh, being put to use for both uh, insulation and structural purposes in buildings. Uh, great excitement around uh, algae-based cements, both in terms of the algae making the limestone to go into the cement, but also the algae uh, being able to be the binder um, and the microbe-grown uh, uh, cements that, uh, that Bruce also mentioned. Um, now making sort of bricks, tiles, and hopefully soon uh, ready mix concrete using using microbes. So all of that together is kind of the, the world of bio-based architecture. And while it might seem like a new concept, uh, there are some really great examples of these biomass materials uh, already being put into buildings at scale. So this is a very uh, a large um, uh, 5,000 square foot school building in France, completely made out of uh, uh, wheat straw, uh, prefabricated wheat straw panels. This is a very large Marks and Spencer mall in the UK, and the uh, the structure is a is a timber frame, and the walls are made from hempcrete panels, precast hempcrete panels. This is a great uh, timber frame and prefabricated straw bale uh, apartment building in France. And uh, a favorite of mine, the Enterprise Center in the UK, um, in which they took the, uh, the thatched uh, roof, the, the thatched roof technology that has been uh, in Europe for uh, thousands of years and turned that same uh, reed into prefabricated cladding panels for this building. Uh, which also uses uh, a whole range of bio-based materials, uh, both on the exterior and the interior of the building. So all kinds of different uh, approaches to making um, bio-based buildings. And this last one that I'll show you, this is a building that I was involved in designing and building here in Peterborough, Canada for Trent University. And they wanted to make uh, a net zero uh, emissions building and we sort of talked them into also making it a net zero uh, emissions on the material side building using, in this case, uh, precast hempcrete blocks and a lot of different bio-based insulations from uh, cellulose to hemp to wood fiber. And we're getting to the point where we can actually measure this stuff and be pretty accurate about it. So for this Trent University building, if it had been built the way the university uh, had intended to build it, uh, it was going to have 498 kilograms of emissions per meter squared, or a total uh, carbon footprint of 211 tons, just to make the materials that made the building. And we were able, through the use of the bio-based materials and through reducing the carbon footprint of the emitting materials, we were able to get that down uh, to just 60 uh, kilograms of emissions per square meter, so an 88% reduction. 
And if we had counted the timber, or if we do count the, the carbon stored in the timber uh, elements of that building, we would have actually got the building into uh, negative territory, or as Bruce mentioned, carbon positive territory, where the building is actually storing more uh, carbon than it was emitting. And so what's interesting about the this realm of, of bio-based materials is that we pretty much already know how to do this. Uh, between the materials that are already on the market, the materials that have been developed, uh, the prototypes that have been done um, in all kinds of you know, shapes and forms, whether they're structural blocks or insulation or foundation materials or cladding materials or roofing materials, you know, people have already figured out how to make carbon storing bio-based materials. And in general, what this, uh, this industry needs now is uh, attention and investment and scale, um, but the technology and the know-how uh, is already uh, well in existence and ready to be put to use. And just as a final note, that, that funding is on the way for all of this. Uh, excitingly, the uh, ARPA-E program at the US Department of Energy just um, granted $39 million in R&D funding uh, to 18 different projects, all specifically focused on uh, turning buildings into carbon storage structures. So this was uh, exciting for the people uh, like me in this space who have been trying to bring attention to the, uh, to the opportunities that exist in, in carbon storing architecture and to have the, uh, the DOE starting to uh, put some significant amount of funding towards bringing more of these novel materials to market uh, is really exciting. And I'll end uh, this section with a, with a great story because always these things are about more than just the material themselves. Um, and if we really want to think about uh, fixing the climate and fixing lots of other things uh, simultaneously, there's no better version of this than the story of Griffin Panels uh, at a company called New Frameworks. They are in Vermont and they had an idea for carbon storing straw and wood fiber based uh, construction panels. And so, you know, they had the technical know-how uh, to make and install those. But in order to do that, they decided to uh, make it um, more than just about the material they teamed up with uh, a couple of organic farms in Vermont and with Migrant Justice so that the materials they're using are um, residues coming from organic farms and then they're therefore supporting um, the, the production at the organic farm. And as a worker co-op, they have invited uh, workers, migrant workers who work on those farms uh, to come and be part of the co-op, to become co-owners of the co-op and to be able to spend the, the, the months that they're not able to work on the farm, working on building these panels and having a, an equity stake in the company as they do that. And I think, you know, this is a great example of how the, the you know, we can achieve numbers in terms of carbon storage by picking materials, but we can also uh, achieve some, some really wonderful uh, benefits uh, for our society as a whole if we go about making carbon storing buildings uh, in a way that contributes to, uh, to more than just negative carbon numbers. And so with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Bruce. Thank you, Chris. Well, how are we gonna get there? Policy. I've been working on policy uh, quite a bit lately um, at the national level, uh, in a way, international level, uh, state level here in California where I live. Policy is a map. Um, it shows you how you can get somewhere. But by itself, a map doesn't give you all the information you need. For starters, you need to know where do you want to go? Let's say you want to go to Denver. Okay, fine. You need one more piece of information, which is where are you now? Okay, you're in uh, Maryland. Fine. Well, a map tell, shows you how you can get there. Chris and I have sketched out, and in our book we flesh out a bit more, um, how we might go to truly climate-friendly building, buildings that are climate healers rather than climate villains. Well, how would you craft policy? Uh, boy, there's an all-out conversation right now 
a lot of cities and counties, a lot of states, the federal government. But it starts with EPDs. Uh, as Chris outlined for you earlier, environmental product declarations are the currency of the realm in the sense that if you can't measure it, you can't improve on it. And EPDs are the only way we know that any particular product is truly carbon storing or not, or what exactly its footprint is. Until you know that, you just don't know what you're dealing with. But if you start to gather EPDs, then you know what the global warming potential is of all the different products you might be interested in. If you start to count them up, but for any particular product, it might be a yard of 4,000 PSI concrete, it might be a doorknob, it might be a roll of carpet, but for any category of product, you can now find um, a bunch of EPDs, maybe just a few, maybe a lot, but if you gather them all up for your particular area, you'll eventually get some sort of bell curve that gives you an industry average for your area. And with that, you can set policy. And this is the trend that we're seeing now at, at all levels uh, that I'm working on anyway, and that I'm hearing about. Find out what your industry average is. Uh, that's easily available on, on uh, online website, uh, EC3 website, uh, Embodied Carbon and Construction Calculator. I should have put their website up here for you, but I'm happy to provide it in the chat later. Once you know the industry average, this is what everybody in your area is doing for 4,000 PSI concrete or doorknobs or whatever it might be. And then you set some threshold slightly higher than that and say, you cannot go above that anymore. That's our limit. That's, that's the line we draw. So everybody who's above that line has to improve somehow on their performance. The beauty of the system is that with time, it self-improves because the industry average will keep nudging to the left and getting lower and lower in global warming potential. So that without even having to change the letter of the law, we, we rewrite it every three years as we typically do with building codes, it will self-improve and the industry will get better and better and better. Right now it's a little tough sometimes because we don't have that many numbers. What if you don't know EPDs for 4,000 PSI concrete in your area? A lot of people are wrestling with this and people in the industry will shriek and shout and say, well, you, we can't do anything. We can't govern it yet because we don't know enough. It gives you a very mushy bell curve and you don't really know what your industry average is. Well, that's true, but uh, we know enough now that we can start writing policy and we do. And the policy comes in two basic forms, sticks and carrots. Sticks are building codes, basically, other variations on the theme, but telling you what you can and cannot do. Uh, in Marin County, we did the uh, low carbon concrete code. Uh, first that we know of uh, was done anywhere that address carbon emissions through building code. Uh, ASHRAE is working on a uh, national standard right now. Cal Green likewise is working on standards. They're all basically sticks and nobody really likes that. It's not a great way to move change behavior or move a society or move the, the gigantic ship that is the construction industry. Nonetheless, you have to have it. Nobody wants to have more rules telling them what they can't do. Nobody, people who enforce it don't like it either, by the way, in case you didn't notice. But then there's carrots, maybe much more powerful. Procurement policies, the General Services Administration just announced a few months ago that they're gonna only be buying low carbon concrete and asphalt and soon other materials as well. Uh, Buy Clean California, a similar measure, and then private companies like Microsoft up in Seattle, when they built the new campus, they put the word out well ahead of time, we're only gonna be looking for low carbon materials, low carbon versions of whatever stuff we're buying. Uh, one of the biggest developers, oldest developers in the country, Heinz, similar pronouncement. They're only looking for low carbon stuff. So these are the basic forms of policy. In Marin County, as I said, we did this low carbon building code. I love this picture as our poster child. This is the new San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge. Took, a, took us a while to build it after the earthquake of 1989, but. We finally did, and Caltrans, the California Department of Transportation used low carbon concrete to build this, not because they wanted to do right by the climate, though they were certainly aware of that, but because low carbon concrete is just better concrete in many ways, such as resistance to salt water. And so this bridge was built using low carbon concrete, much more resistant to permeability of chloride ions. In the big picture, I've already talked about both carbon and hydrogen. We have to find ways to make them available so that we can do our metals, 
We can capture carbon from the air and turn it into aggregates and other building materials. And we can enlist the help of our little friends, the microbes, to make bricks and all sorts of other things that we are only barely starting to uh, picture right now. That requires a new circulatory system. Just as you and I have a blood system running through our bodies, the Earth currently has a circulatory system, which is a fossil hydrocarbon system. Oil and gas pipelines, ships on the ocean right now by the hundreds moving oil and gas and coal all over the place to fuel the economy that you and I live in. And we need to transform that to a carbon and hydrogen economy so that those two fundamental elements can be made available, not just to the building industry, but all industries. The building industry just happens to use a lot more physical stuff than any other. So we're a good candidate to bring emissions down. And thus we announce our goal for 15 gigatons a year by 2050. Zero just isn't gonna cut it. Getting to zero means we're doing less harm. It's like saying I beat my wife and I'm beating her less and less all the time. That doesn't really cut it. We offer a positive vision. Imagine if every company on earth started competing. What if we could write policy to get everybody to be competing to be the lowest and lowest carbon materials or to put it the other way, as Chris and I prefer, absorbing more and more carbon in every doorknob and every roll of carpet and every cubic yard of concrete that gets made. If we could get everybody moving in that direction, we might be able to pull this off. It's not so much a matter of reducing your carbon footprint, though that's important. As a company, as a government, as an individual, eat less meat, drive less, uh, all that stuff, sure. But be much more important is to have a bigger carbon handprint. Whatever you can do, do it. And we use this analogy. You remember the movie Apollo 13 from, I don't know, 30 years ago? True story about the Apollo 13 mission of 1970. I think it was our third moon mission. Uh, and they had a problem. On the way out, they realized they were bleeding oxygen into space. There's these three guys in the capsule all alone out there headed to the moon, but running out of air. They quickly figured out that they could adjust their flight a little bit, whip around the backside of the moon and come straight back to Earth. They wouldn't be able to land on the moon, but they'd be able to get back to Earth. Okay, that solved that problem. Then they realized that they weren't out of the woods yet. The astronauts were sitting in the capsule breathing and exhaling carbon dioxide, which was going to asphyxiate them before they got back to Earth. Enough carbon dioxide in the air will actually kill you. We're not anywhere close to that level on Earth right now, but it was interesting to them and it was important to them. So here they are in this capsule that's filling up with carbon dioxide from their own exhalations as they run out of oxygen. What are they gonna do? So there came this moment that I call the geek's finest hour. Great scene in the movie. And the mission commander gathers his engineers in a little room and says, this is the stuff they have available to them in the space capsule devise a CO2 filter so that they can clean the CO2 out of the air and remain alive. And here's the kicker. The astronauts were getting sleepier and sleepier by the hour because carbon dioxide will make you, will fuzz up your brain. You'll lose cognitive ability. So the astronauts were basically getting dumber and, and sleepier by the hour. So the engineers not only had to figure out the filter, but communicate it to some people so that they could re replicate what they'd done and save the day. Well, of course they did manage to save the day, it all worked out, but uh, the metaphor sort of slaps you right up in the face, doesn't it? This is the situation we're in now. We're working out the technology by which to clean the CO2 out of the air. There's still some interesting technology to be invented, but for the most part, we've got it down. What we have to do is communicate it to the people that we share the planet with. Our species evolved over the last half million years away from the primate family tree in a very comfortable carbon womb between two and 300 parts per million. And now we're at 414 and it's a problem as you all know. And it's just like being in the spaceship. So we have to get it down. Our contention is bring the carbon home and a great place to put it is in our buildings. And with that, we say thank you. Okay, thank you both. And we'll have you turn on your cameras for um, the question and answer. Thanks to everybody who submitted questions. We have about 30 minutes here.
more questions um, and we'll get to as many as we can. And I guess I'll start with this one from Herman Huang who asks, um, how much bio-based building is going on now? I'm trying to get an idea of how much unrealized potential there is. And Chris, you may need to unmute. I don't know that anybody's counting, but as a percentage of what's being built, bio-based materials, I don't know, what do you think, Bruce, does it even show? It's pretty like, small. It's prevalent. It's small. Most of us, I assume most of the listeners are, are in North America, as Chris and I are, and we've grown up with wood frame buildings. Um, so it's very common if you happen to live near a northern arboreal forest where lumber is cheap and readily available. Most of the world, I showed those slides of Sao Paulo and Cairo in Beijing, there was no wood there. It was all, all concrete and brick. And that's what the world is building with right now. So in a sense, the answer to your question is worldwide, bio-based materials are a very, very small fraction. And they could be a which, much, which, much larger one. Right, which to, which to go to the second part of your question means the opportunity is vast. You know, we know that the, the stocks of bio-based materials are huge. We know how to turn those huge stocks into viable building materials, but but we're we're at sort of uh, the first real step in in starting to try to realize that potential. Okay, thank you. Uh, we got several questions along this line, uh, which I'll read one from Caleb Bowen who asked, um, "How does the life expectancy of bio-based construction materials compare against concrete and steel?" Gee, we've never gotten that question before. <laughs> I'll go first, because Chris kind of answered that question. He touched on it anyway, because we get this question all the time. And sure, if you get them wet, they'll rot. If, if you throw them in the fire, they'll, they'll burn generally. So sure, they're not as durable as concrete. Um, however, we're tricky beings, and we know how to make them be durable now. And uh, sometimes they're actually better. Uh, but the point being that here we are in climate emergency where we're in triage and we got to do what we can. And it's not like we're in, I'm suggesting we'd be in a panic and do anything and everything. But as Chris made the point in one of his slides, if we build a whole bunch of stuff out of straw all of a sudden, um, we've taken that carbon out of the air. We can take a very large chunk of carbon out of the air. And even if some of the buildings burn or rot or something like that, as all buildings fall apart one way or another eventually. Um, we will have taken that carbon out of the air for whatever period of time they're still there. And we know how to make them be durable against fire and rot and all of that. We know how to do that now. So, yeah, sure, they're more fragile than concrete. Everything's more fragile than concrete and steel. But concrete and steel have their own problems, mainly that they're extremely high emitters of greenhouse gases. Yeah, and I would follow up on that by saying, too, that, that you know, the parts of the building that are most susceptible to the, that kind of wear, either weathering, uh, weathering would be the big one, sort of exposure to moisture. You know, I showed you some pictures of large carbon storing buildings, a bunch of them had metal siding or, you know, um, other materials that protect those carbon-based materials. So the idea is not that every single material in a building has to be uh, carbon-based uh, or, you know, bio-based. Um, and in fact, you know, you could make, say, a concrete frame building that has uh, all kinds of bio-based materials inside it, uh, on the outside of it, well protected, and the, the net carbon balance of that building could still be carbon storing. So it's not that we have to throw out all use of metal or all use of concrete, but, um, you know, we would be able to sort of uh, combine bio-based materials with other materials to get buildings that have a, a sort of a, a net carbon storage. Um, and then, you know, when we get to the exciting things like, you know, aggregate for concrete that's made out of waste CO2 or, uh, you know, bricks that are grown by microbes but have all the same properties as concrete but have pulled that carbon out of the atmosphere to make that brick, you know, then we start to see the opportunities to have both the durability of concrete and the carbon storage at the same time. So I think, you know, it's it's a case of like 
yes and you know we need all of those things uh, happening simultaneously um but uh you know we we've seen all around the world for you know hundreds and even thousands of years buildings that have survived uh you know for a long long time made out of timber made out of earth made out of straw um so you know built well maintained properly um, you know, there's there's really no reason to not be using these materials from a durability point of view. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, next question here is: uh, Does storing biomass in buildings for the lifespan of the building have any significant negative effects on the occupants of the building? If anything, I would say it's the opposite. So in I did a uh, like a large study for the the Canadian federal government on bio-based materials, mostly you know looking at this carbon footprint side of things. But one of the interesting things I noticed from the environmental product declarations, um, so EPDs they give you the global warming potential, but they also comment on six other aspects of uh, of environmental impact and. For every bio-based material that I had in that report, it was not only better on the carbon footprint side, but it had smaller impacts in all the other categories uh, as the as its sort of competitors did as well. Um, and quite often, less uh, less or no uh, toxins or chemicals of question in those materials. So, if anything, I would say the the bio-based materials are better for both the people in the buildings. Uh, the workers who make the buildings and anybody who deals with the, the sort of the waste or the, the the remnants of that building when it's disassembled. Yeah, I, I would also just point out, uh, notice uh, the movies and TV when they want to uh, depict wealth, the rich guy, Downton Abbey. Uh, what kind of room do you see? It's full of natural materials. As a stone fireplace, it has a wood floor or a stone floor. It has a, a wool rug. It has leather furniture. It has wood paneling, and on and on and on. Uh, of course, there's the Jetsons version of the rich guy, which is all plastic and glass and and uh, you know sterile, which doesn't appeal to me much. But um, we grew up with natural materials, and um, we like to live with them around us. We like to have them around. Um, I'd say they're a whole lot healthier. That's just an aesthetic comment, of course, but um, I just concur with Chris. In many ways, they're just better. Would you rather would you rather have wood paneling or a concrete wall in your bedroom? I mean, really. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, we'll keep going through the questions. And the next one here is, are there building code standards that need to be updated to enable the use of carbon smart, smart architecture? Oh, yeah, we're working on it. That's all I can say, and they don't change fast, those codes. Um, you'll be shocked, shocked to hear that uh, some entrenched industries that I won't name resist the notion of changing the building code in any way that might be unfavorable to their market interests. But we're working on it. There's a whole lot of change that needs to happen. The building codes uh, need a lot of work, but that's a, that's a tough slog. Okay, next one here is, uh, what is the price differential between the bio-based products and traditional building materials? Well, again, I'll, I'll go back to the, the study that I did for the, the Canadian federal government, because they obviously asked that question. And the answer was, there's absolutely no correlation between carbon footprint and price. So, you know, across that study, Sometimes the, the carbon storing material was the cheapest material, sometimes it was the most expensive in its category, and sometimes it was in the middle, and vice versa. The highest emitting material was sometimes the cheapest, was sometimes the most expensive, but essentially it's no predictor. So it really, it's, it's about that, the particular material uh, that you're looking at, because it, it, there's not, it's not like, oh, all of this bio-based material is more expensive. Um, certain bio-based products are more expensive and others are actually, even right now, today, cheaper, like cellulose insulation, cheapest insulation you can buy, also carbon storing. So, you know, it exists across the spectrum. What I would say to that, though, is that the feedstocks to make 
these bio-based materials are by and large way less expensive than either the minerals or the petrochemicals that that are currently being used to make uh, materials and that the price difference is usually uh, about scale and not about um, actual affordability so you know the what it takes to take some wheat straw off a field and take it somewhere and press it into a block or a panel and put it in a building is way should should be way cheaper than you know uh, getting some ore out of the ground and you know melting it at high temperature and forming it into a sheet or you know grinding up some rock and burning it at high temperature so we can turn it back into a rock or you know any other process that we use to make materials should be more expensive than the bio-based option and where they're not it's just because nobody's doing the bio-based option at, at a reasonable enough scale to uh to realize those savings in the case of concrete, very often, um, in fact, in my career as a structural engineer, always, every concrete mix I ever worked with on every project from high-rise buildings to houses uh, had more cement in it than it needed. And cement is most of the footprint, carbon footprint of concrete. So you can make low-carbon concrete just by using less cement. And you can use a lot less cement and still have all the strength and durability you need just by paying a little bit of attention. That's a whole long conversation in itself, but we're just accustomed to using a lot more cement than we need, mostly because it makes it extra strong. Nobody ever worries about getting a call back because something went wrong in the concrete. And you only needed 3,000 PSI and you got 7,000 PSI and everybody's happy because it was cheap and who cared? Now we care. And so we have to be less cavalier about using high carbon materials. So oftentimes the low carbon alternative is the cheaper alternative. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, next question here is uh, from Marie Belong, who says, uh, concrete is used for other things besides buildings, such as roads and other infrastructure that we depend on. Will these bio-based materials be used for that as well, or can they? Probably not, no. There's stuff, infrastructure stuff, which you're referring to, the stuff around the buildings, the, the, the water pipes, the highways, the bridges. You need to make them out of rock. You need them to be super, super durable. And with a few exceptions here and there, and maybe Chris is thinking of something right now, it's mostly gonna be concrete and metals. There's all the more reason why we need to drive policy and building codes to reduce the footprint of those industries so that when we're, when we're building our infrastructure with concrete and metals, they're a lot less uh, emissions intensive than they are right now. And again, we can do we can make a huge difference just right now just by paying attention. I just learned something just the other day. There's an on the market available cement alternative. You grind up limestone really fine and mix it in with the cement and then bag that up and use that. You get all the same strength, all the same durable, everything you want, type, type IL cement. If everybody on, in the world started using that in the concrete industry, we would reduce global emissions by more than a percent. It'd be the equivalent of all the emissions of California being erased. On, on the shelf, approved by building departments and transportation departments, it's available now. But just we don't use it because nobody's paying attention. Yeah, and I would just follow up by saying, you know, some of the more exciting things that we pointed to, the algae concrete, the microbe concrete, the, the aggregate made out of waste CO2, though, those are the pathways that will get those infrastructure materials to be carbon storing, not so much that they're uh, bio-based as in as in plant-based but that they that they are you know made from atmospheric co2 rather than made from uh you know billion year old uh co2 that that uh, that we uh, mined out of the ground thanks chris next question here's from eric lowry he says uh, first great presentation I know there's a big focus on new construction, but what about material choices to retrofit existing structures? Can you recommend a good resource for materials and methods to for retrofitting applications? Chris and I have a lot of colleagues who are working in that domain, and I'm really thank you for asking because it's actually it's actually really the giant op in the world, realm of buildings. It's the giant opportunity vs climate is to retrofit the buildings we have because we've spent 
a hundred years building basically crappy buildings in the sense that they're energy inefficient, they leak, they're not insulated. All over the world, uh, we're stuck with a whole bunch of really bad buildings. And the first climate priority is to retrofit those buildings, give them an energy upgrade. So the question is, what do you, what do, you do the upgrade with? Um, the presumption, I mean, the, 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 the template scenario here is that you keep structure and shell. You keep the foundation, the structure, and the building enclosure, because that's where most of the carbon emissions already happen, so you don't have to do that again and generate more emissions. So then you're thinking about how you're going to insulate it and finish it out and stuff like that. And there are a whole realm of materials. Chris touched on a lot of them actually already, like cellulose insulation instead of plastic foam insulation. Um, Chris, you want to add something to that? Sure. Yeah. There, I mean, you know, it's there's it could be a bit of a just a catalog of materials, which um, being a materials nerd, I'd be happy to do. But I'll just say my I have colleagues at, at Rocky Mountain Institute who are right now uh, putting together a, um, a compendium of carbon storing retrofit materials for buildings. So that's a resource that, that will be coming soon. Um, but essentially, you know, avoiding the the the, the plastic foam and uh, mineral-based insulation and using existing bio-based. So Bruce did mention cellulose uh, for residential retrofits. That's great. There are some really great uh, wood fiberboard products made from uh, waste wood. Uh, a number of the companies who just received that that Hestia grant from DOE that I mentioned. Uh, they're working on on different uh, bio-based panelized uh, insulation uh, methods, like for making panels that you can surround an existing building with. Um, so there are some uh, some resources out there. I would uh, point you to the um, the Endeavor Center website, endeavorcenter.org, which has a a good materials uh, encyclopedia for for residential scale retrofits. Um, but they 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 are out there. They're likely not the first option that your retrofitter or renovator contractor is putting in front of you. But once you're sort of uh, aware of the carbon footprint of materials, you can start to you know specifically ask you know what is the carbon footprint of this material that you're retrofitting my building with, and and are there lower carbon options? That's a great way to get that conversation started. Thanks, Chris. Our next one here is from Troy Wynn, who asks, if we pull biomass that is normally plowed back into the earth following harvest to restore nutrients back to the soil out of that agricultural cycle, using it for construction, what impact would that have on our long-term agricultural productivity? And would we end up starving ourselves by ruining our bread baskets? Oh, well, boy. you'll notice in, uh, in my <laughs> slide about, about grain straw that I was talking about uh, you know, thinking about half of what was available uh, to be available for buildings. And that's because currently, well, in, in with grain straw in particular, about sort of 10 to 20 percent of that, uh, that annual harvest does go back into the soil. And so, you know, obviously we don't want that to, to not go back into the soil. So, you know, everything that I've ever cataloged in the way of available biomass is literally that. It's the available biomass. It's like, what do you do after you know, the farmer doesn't need it anymore after it's not, you know, animal bedding, after it's not going back into the soil, you know, there's still, you know, billions of tons left in addition to that. So we certainly wouldn't want to be endorsing, you know, robbing the, the soil of that or, or taking any of the, the existing purposes away. But what we see is an opportunity because the vast majority of that biomass is not you know, being being put to any use uh, like feeding the soil or feeding animals or anything like that. And so that's what we see as as available to go into buildings. When I started researching straw bale construction 25 or so years ago, uh, I, I toured a rice farm and California grows a lot of rice. And I drove up a few hours north, to, you know, it's dead flat in Central Valley and a great rice growing region and the farmer was showing me around and he commented he just looked around and he said you know the soil here is completely sterile it, it's been sterile for years if not decades he says i go spray on it all the nutrients that the rice will need and then i plant the rice and then i harvest the rice and then i burn the straw 
goes up in the air. Very little of the nutrients, a little bit of ash falls into the soil, but essentially the soil was stripped of any kind of natural condition or nutrients a long time ago. It was a bit shocking, but the implication was that's typical for cereal grain production around the world, at least in the industrialized parts of the world. And so it touches on a huge topic, your question does, um, of, of agriculture and, and things we need to do because we've basically decarbonized soil all over the world with industrial agriculture and threw the carbon up in the air or washed it down the stream or whatever and there's sterile soils, we've, we've lost our topsoil. I've worked in Haiti, I, I've seen what happens when a country loses its topsoil. I mean, you are screwed when you don't have topsoil anymore. And of course, there's all sorts of wonderful people uh, at work now on organic and especially regenerative agriculture, carbon farming, finding ways to grow the food we need, but also get, um, get bring the soil back to life, put the carbon back in it so that the little microbes can do the thing that they do so magically and restore it. Um, and that's gonna ongoingly be a related conversation to how we get building materials, especially agricultural byproducts and so on. So deep related topic, but certainly nothing that we can do justice to right now today. Yeah, and that's that's why I really wanted to tell that new frameworks story as as part of the the carbon storing building thing is because you know they made the conscious decision to not buy their straw from farmers who are stripping the soil of carbon or you know harming uh, the soil in any other ways. They specifically set out to make partnerships with regenerative farms where you know the the straw that they're taking is in addition to what that farm needs to put back into the soil, but that those farming practices are also putting carbon in back into the soil. So they're putting the carbon, the, the above grade carbon into buildings and the farm's putting the, the, the you know, carbon back into the soil. And there's actually you know, a kind of double benefit to, uh, to using egg residues when they're being generated in that way. So that's you know, part of my reason for wanting to, to include that story is that it's critically important if we're going to turn to agricultural residues as a source of building materials that 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 goes hand in hand with you know regenerative agriculture and and also thinking of soils as important carbon repositories and not just uh, a bunch of you know uh, material off the top of the soil great thank you our next question here is from Ahmad Kayeo who asks um Besides low carbon concrete, what are the most effective strategies to reduce embodied carbon in high rises in large buildings? And which bio-based materials can realistically be used at that scale today? There's only one bio-based material that you can go more than um, 15 stories with right now, and that's mass timber. And so you hear a lot about mass timber, um, but I, I you know, it's it. You answered your own question. It's low carbon concrete, eventually steel made with hydrogen. We can bring this the footprint of steel down to zero or pretty close to zero, and we can make concrete that gets to zero and even is carbon storing. That's about a generation away still, I would say. Other than that, the only I mean, there was no alternative to concrete and steel up until just a couple of decades ago with the advent of mass timber and being able to do massive, tall complicated structures with pieces of, you know, small pieces of wood glued back together, sort of like concrete, a lot, bunch of little rocks glued together to make a big rock. And so there's exciting possibilities with mass timber. I forget what the latest record is. I think Vancouver, or, oh, it's not there. It's someplace else, but um, 15 stories, I think, but conceptually much higher. But I'm gonna echo what Chris said that we're not enthusiastic about mass timber it only makes sense if you live near a softwood forest and that's parts of the Northern hemisphere, basically. If we want, I just saw a number, if we just, if we wanted to replace a quarter of the concrete building going on in the world right now, just a quarter of it, we would need to not just plant, but have a mature softwood forest one and a half times the size of India in order to feed a quarter of the buildings that are currently made out of concrete. It's just not promising and Furthermore, there aren't that many forests left. Leave the freaking forest alone. Let our children have a place to walk and wander. There's so much carbon. Basically, one of the, the, the bottleneck is, um, is glue. Finding the right kinds of glues, family of glues, 
that are environmentally friendly, that are affordable, that are scalable, by which we can take this extraordinary torrent of agricultural byproducts that Chris talked about and turn them into sheathing and insulation and structure um, and store the carbon that we're producing anyway. So the answer to your question for tall buildings, and I'm no big fan of tall buildings, but they're going to be with us for a while, is um, for structure, there's the only alternative is mass timber. And you can get mass timber uh, from sustainably harvested sources. You have to ask for it and look for it, but you can. But that's the qualified answer to your question. Yeah, I would add to that by saying, first of all, you know, that there's there's a, a a point of no return with tall buildings where the taller it goes, the more embodied carbon it's going to have. Um, you know, quite a few people have have studied that, and so you know, maybe one of the questions we need to ask is how tall is appropriate. Um, but even even beyond that, I think you know we tend to want to see these things as a, as an either or, like either the building is all bio based or it's a concrete building, but you know, what I'd like to point to is right now, make a big, tall concrete building if that's what you need to make. Make it out of the lowest carbon concrete you can find and fill the interior with all the available biomass materials. Like, you know, I've done a, a, a couple of studies for people retrofitting one floor of a large building. And if you just make the interior partitions, the flooring, the ceiling, and a little bit of insulation that's inside those concrete buildings out of out of biomass, that that will outweigh the emissions from the concrete frame, or at least equal it. So it's not a case of like, ah, oh, we got to throw all concrete building out the window, and and we can only use plants from now on. I think it's especially for today. It's how do we balance that? How do we put the materials we have that we already have available to us, a lot of which are sort of interior based materials inside a building that has, you know, that that concrete frame and do it in a way that, you know, starts to drive towards net carbon storage. If for now we can turn a tall concrete building from having 800, you know, kilograms of emissions per square meter down to 100 because there's so much biomass in it, that's great. And as the carbon footprint of that concrete lowers, that number will start to dip into the into the carbon storing realm. So I think you know we want to think of these things as as not sort of exclusive of one another, but as as um, as you know something that we put together. Right now, you put together the the kind of frame you need for the kind of building you need to build, and then add you know biomass materials wherever you can uh, inside and and attach to uh, those buildings. Thank you. I know we're getting near the end and I'd just like to ask a couple more questions before closing thoughts. Um, yeah. So thanks to everybody for submitting all these questions today. As, as usual, we won't be able to get to them all. But here's one from Rachel Bailey who says, I will be starting a new position as a housing development manager for a nonprofit and providing a variety of repair services to residents in need. What suggestions do you have for me to shift the, to sustainable carbon smart repairs and hopefully single and multifamily affordable housing in the future. Thank you from an urban planner in Buffalo, New York. <laughs> my, my immediate reaction is to say, you know, call me because that's, you know, you're who I want to be talking with. Uh, but um, I would say to start with, if you uh, look at some of the reports that we've done at Builders for Climate Action, they are specifically about how to build low carbon and carbon storing buildings at that scale. So we did one for the federal government and for the city of Toronto and for the city of Nelson. So there's lots of good stuff uh, in there. And um, I think you'll find that that will lead you to uh, all kinds of other resources. Um, but also, uh, I'm serious when I say, you know, call me. I'd love to talk to you about that. Great. Excellent. Um, so I think with that, we'll go ahead and move into some closing thoughts today. And uh, just wanted to ask you to kind of share some key takeaways from where we ended up. And uh, let's start with uh, Bruce, and then we'll go to Chris. Chris and I get asked a lot, are you optimistic? And um, read the book, you'll find out. Um, and people say, what can I do? 
what can I do? To which the answer is, of course, I don't know what you can do, but if you don't start looking for what you can do, you'll never find it. Chris and I are just two guys who are just sort of bumbling along through life. We say, well, maybe we saw a problem that needed solving. And said, oh, nobody else is doing this. I'll think if I'll, I'll think about this. Maybe I'll try to solve it. And I'll, I'll write the book or I'll start the organization or I'll talk to somebody. And one thing led to another. And here we are producing a book and talking to you all right now. But my point being, intend, do, do what you can with what you got, where you are, um, whether it's buildings or clothing or food or whatever. But um, the strange thing about climate emergency is even that so many of us who are aware of it feel paralyzed with inaction. And that's, that's a false attitude. And, and, it's, and it's a crushing one. It's a soul crushing one. When if you start to pay attention from wherever you are in your life, doing whatever you do, and start looking around, you'll probably start, as Chris and I have, start finding lots of cool people who are doing cool things. And you find a place to start getting active and doing something. Please do. Hey, thanks, Bruce. All right. Now, well, I don't know that I have that much to uh, to add to what Bruce just said, other than I do. I find it exciting, and and my hope is that the whole building industry, as as like you know, conservative and slow moving and and sort of uh, you know tough to change as it is, this particular industry has this opportunity to not have its basic core business model threatened by the climate emergency. You know, if you're if you're a, a an oil, you know, in the oil business or in so many other, you know, uh, lines of work, the change to a lower carbon economy, you know, directly threatens you and, and what you do and how you do it. And the building industry, you know, as we've tried to point out in the book, can keep building buildings and can actually shift from doing that work and causing the climate to fail to doing that work and helping the climate to not fail or to get better um, and still build buildings and still design them and still install them and still make money from them. And you know, there, there is a, an actual feasible business model for the build, building industry to both do right by the climate and to keep doing what we do, we just have to get smarter and better at it. Um, and I don't think there's very many uh, sort of, you know, industries on the planet that have that opportunity. And so um, it might be misplaced optimism, but I think, you know, it's it's exciting to be in a profession where, where you can see that carbon positive future and it still includes you. And that's, you know, really what, what I sort of hope that people in the building industry see is that this is not an existential threat. It's a, it's a redirection. You got to learn some new stuff, find some new materials, you know, push at the codes and do all the work. But, but in the end, that work is still there to be done. And, and it doesn't, it doesn't bring uh, everything that we have been doing to a, to a, a grinding halt. Great. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Bruce. Thanks for being with us today. Yeah, thanks to everybody who uh, took the time out to do this today. Thank you all. It's been a pleasure to be here with you. Excellent. Well, with that, we're going to conclude our webinar today, Build Beyond Zero, New Ideas for Carbon Smart Architecture. I would like to offer a great big thank you to Bruce King and Chris Magwood for a great presentation, to everyone who attended today, and to John Coleman, our communications and technology guru who helps to make this all happen. The complete recording of today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org. Also, for those of you who have requested one, all attendees will receive an email that will contain a link to a personalized certificate of participation. Please look for this follow-up email if you need this certificate to claim other continuing education credits. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. Finally, keep an eye on smartgrowth.org and your email inbox for details on other future webinars, including the past, present, and future of electric bicycling with Carlton Reed, Dylan Fitch, and Andrew Brown, which will be held this Thursday, June 23rd at 1 p.m. Eastern. With that, I wish everybody a rest. Hope you have a great day for the rest of the day. Take care.